Anybody feel his presence in the atmosphere? It's nothing like it. There's no greater feeling than to be in the, the presence of Almighty God. And we're just so thankful for all of you here today. Uh, thankful for Pastor Mark, Pastor Carol. Come on, let's celebrate them. Thank God they're well rested. I told the last service, I said, you know, it's something. I, I believe pastoring is the most important job in the world, and it ain't close. Uh, because they are charged to watch over all of our souls, over 400 of us to be, uh, to be, you know, correct. And with that being said, over 400 of us, I told, you know, Pastor Mark and Pastor Carol that God have increased their uh, responsibility 100-fold because they got four children. Now they got over 400 members. So let's give God a praise and keep them in prayer. <laughs> We know how bad Michael was. Lord, that's one alone. <laughs> Amen. Anybody glad just to be in his presence again? You know, Ohio State won yesterday, so we got a reason. All right. Lord, John, me and John was at the game yesterday sweating, so I'm already tired. So <laughs> Y'all pray for me. But uh, I got some family members here. I got my, two of my favorite people in the whole world, my uncle and my aunt Tim, uh, my uncle Tim, excuse me, aunt, and my aunt Nudie is with us today. Thank you all for being with us. They are busy. They have very busy schedules in ministry themselves, and for them to take the time, we were out camping um, at Buckeye Lake this weekend and just had a great time with them. My wife is with us this service. Amen. I tried to get her to come to two. She said, I ain't about to hear your same message twice. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> Even me, I ain't got that much favor. Lord, that much. <laughs> but we thank God for y'all being here. So let us uh, grab our Bibles. Turn to Acts 27. I'm reading your hearing verses 18 through 26, the NLT version. Acts 27. Scripture reads, the next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, plotting. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone selling with you. Verse 25 says, so take courage for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but, contingency, we will be shipwrecked on an island. Today, I want to speak to you all from this subject, and that subject is, I got the wind knocked out of me. I got the wind knocked out of me. Anybody here knows what it feels like to get the wind knocked out of you? Mm-hmm. Whether if it was in a fight, whether if it was playing sports or some extracurricular activity, rather if it was from an accident, or some sort of thing that slows your momentum down and causes you to stop dead in your tracks. As a kid, I can remember a moment that I will never forget when I got the wind knocked out of me. I was like eight, nine years old, and I was taking karate. There were some neighborhood men in the community who wanted 
you know, to help the local neighborhood kids, I'm sure to teach good disciplines to. And we lived off of Joyce Avenue in a community called the American Edition. Now, this community may, the name alone may sound grand, but trust me, you're not going to refer a tourist to this place. <laughs> All you have to do is just go down to the American Edition and see, but there's nothing to see but a junkyard right across the street. But I will say they did build a house on American Extreme Makeover Home Edition. They ended up building a house in that community. You might want to go check that out. It's a Buckeye house. Besides that, run. <laughs> but, you know, we took these karate classes at Trey Lee Recreation Center. I don't know why. To this day, they called it a rec center because there was no gymnasium inside. There was no basketball courts. There was no bleachers, but it was just this small room that I remember that was big enough to host these karate classes. But taking karate along with three of my other cousins was one of the most proudest childhood memories that I have. I remember when my sensei gave me my all white karate suit. I was clean, all white, and I had a white belt, and they taught me how to tie the belt. You couldn't tell me nothing at that point. You know, I would wear this karate suit proudly even around the neighborhood. And it was kind of intimidating, right? Because, you know, as a kid, when you see another kid in a karate suit, you're like, oh, wait a minute, leave him alone. He knows karate. <laughs> and, you know, I have to help some of you young people who's here today. Y'all wasn't born in the 80s. Y'all didn't live in the 80s. But in the 80s, karate was huge. It was shown on local TV stations, and Bruce Lee was the king of kung fu movie entertainment. I got a witness, uh, Baby Boomers and Generation X. Ain't nobody bigger than Bruce Lee. You can keep your uh, Steven Seagal's and your Van Dams. Ain't got nothing on Bruce Lee, I promise you. But I will wear this karate suit everywhere. And I remember one year for Halloween, mind you, I didn't grow up in the church like my children who uh, has not forgiven me for today because they've never been trick-or-treating. But uh, <laughs> we took them to Hallelujah Night, all right? That made it even kind of more perplexing because they're like, we only get to dress up as angels or a Roman soldier. <laughs> like, what is a Roman soldier? You go to school, I'm a Roman soldier. Like, what is that? <laughs> Get a little Dollar Tree shield and a sword put in their hand. <laughs> Off you go, son. Celebrate. <laughs> but me and my cousins, <laughs> we all dressed up alike because our parents couldn't even afford Halloween costumes. So they said, guess what y'all going to be for Halloween this year? Karate kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I was getting good at karate, y'all, and I was taking it seriously. And I was practicing my katas. Still, I still remember them today, some of them anyway. And, you know, sometimes I would try the moves that I learned at the dojo. I would try them at home. And I was getting good. I remember I was getting in trouble, and my mother would try to whoop me. And so she would swing her belt, and I would block it like, Hugh! That didn't help, not with my mama. That only made her matter, so she just kept swinging and swinging. That block didn't work, y'all. That, that whooping still hurt. <laughs> but I remember getting into a sparring match without of all people, the sensei's son. And the sensei's son was supposed to be good, right? But as we're sparring, you know, we're lining up, and but I started taking it to him. And I did this kind of like hand chop like kind of to the face. We shouldn't have been going to the face, but I, I hit him in the face and accidentally end up busting his lip. And so the sensei stopped the match, like, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, stop, time out. And so the sensei's father took his son's place. Yeah. <laughs> and so we started sparring. Now his father was a huge man. If I can recall, if I had to take a guess, 
I'm going to remember, I'm an eight, nine-year-old kid. This man had to be every bit of 6'3", 6'4", 200 plus pounds. He was huge. We're sparring, and this big grown man does a roundhouse kick right into my stomach, and it literally knocked the wind out of me. <laughs> and, you know, I immediately, when I got the wind knocked out of me, I, I fell to the ground, and I, I dropped to my knees as I was gasping for breath. It was a horrible feeling. It was an uncomfortable feeling because from a medical sense, getting the wind knocked out of you causes temporary paralysis of the diaphragm. Getting the wind knocked out of you is an idiom that means you get hit so hard for a second, you can't breathe. If anybody knew what it was and what it felt like to get the wind knocked out of them, it was the Apostle Paul. I love Paul's story and how he testifies about the things he suffered for Christ. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 23-27, and they, and they servants of Christ, are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rocks. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as, the, as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced danger for men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. You talking about somebody who got the wind knocked out of them. It was Paul. Paul was a missionary who often faced the dangers of wind. Through the book of Acts, we read no less, no less than 18 journeys Paul took by ship. Our text that I read earlier in your hearing comes from the 27th act, uh, chapter of Acts. And so you might want to open your Bibles and keep it open to the 27th chapter because we are going to read a few scriptures from this chapter. Most of us are familiar with wind in various forms. And we associate them with some type of thunderstorm, some type of hurricane, some type of tornadoes, things of that nature. But occasionally near the coast, you get these strong, persistent winds that seem to last the entire day. Winds that can literally blow you off your feet, which are called gale force winds. These winds, these gale force winds, are a minimum of 31 miles per hour and a maximum of 63 miles per hour along coastal regions. These were the winds that Paul and several other prisoners faced as they set sail for Rome. So the weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was late in the fall. And if you all cruise, you know, you kind of try to plan your dates accordingly because, yes, it, begins, it gets danger, dangerous at certain times in the sea. And so Paul, he said, look, I want to warn y'all, but the ship's officers, you know, they kind of wanted to do their own thing. He said, men, I believe there is trouble ahead. If we continue, we are going to be shipwrecked. We're going to lose our cargo and our lives is going to be at danger. And so verse 27, chapter 27, verse 11 says, but the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. So they kept selling, but the weather changed abruptly. And a wind called Eurachlodon ends up blowing the ship out of its own control. The sailors couldn't turn into the wind, so they were at the wind's mercy. And that'll preach right there all by itself because sometimes 
We can be coasting along in life. Everything is fine. All is well. Then out of nowhere, a strong wind comes and blows us off, of course, from the direction that we was headed. And the winds and the storms of life impedes our purpose and our progress. And we're left in desperation asking God for help. Where am I, Lord? I feel lost, lost at sea. I, I, I feel lost at the church even though I'm, I'm in the church. I, I, I feel lost. I'm on my job, but I feel lost even in my career. Even though I'm, 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 I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a wife, but I feel lost in my marriage. I'm going wherever the wind blows and carries me. Just going through the motions of life. But in verse 17, the sailors anchored the ship and slowed the ship down, and they were being tossed by the winds. But they survived the first day. But the next day, the second day, Acts 27 and 18 says, gale force winds came and battered the ship. They were literally getting the wind knocked out of them. And isn't that the truth for us? Just when we thought we got over one storm, here comes another one. Hmm. Just paid off all your debt. Now here comes a knock at the door from the IRS. <laughs> One of your kids gets sick, just overcame a sickness, and now here it is again, another kid is sick. Trouble after trouble, storm after storm. <clears throat> Verse 18 to 19 continued on, talking about how the crew began to throw the cargo and the ship's gear overboard for a last-ditch effort because the purpose and the intent was for them to lighten the ship, and to prevent it from sinking. The cargo was goods for trades, and so this was a financial loss. It was. And so the ship's tackle, when it included the ropes and the pulleys and the equipment that was essential for selling. So at this point, y'all, they are totally desperate. When we are facing desperate, life-threatening situations, can I tell you our possessions are meaningless? Our money is meaningless. Our stocks, our investments are meaningless. Our cars, our houses are meaningless. Those things can't save me right now. Those things can't protect me right now. Those things can't free me right now and most certainly cannot heal me right now. The crew on the ship had to lighten the load for, the, for a better chance of survival. And that ought to speak to us today. We ought to lighten our loads. If that means letting go of burdens, if that means letting go of unforgiveness, if that means letting go of our past failures and issues, letting go of toxic and unhealthy relationships, even if that means deleting some people from your social media accounts. Hmm. Lighten the load and let it go. Somebody look at the person next to you and say, let it go and throw it overboard. <laughs> throw it overboard. Can I tell you, depression is too heavy. Yeah. Throw it overboard. Anxiety is too heavy. Throw it overboard. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. Throw it overboard. And so as the scripture goes on, I'm going to teach today and let the text talk. It goes on in verse 20 and it says, The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars, until at last all hope was gone. The wind just kept blowing day after day. The storm just kept raging so much so until there was total darkness at sea. Imagine being stranded in pitch black darkness where all hope is lost. Has anybody here ever been in a dark place? Hmm. A place so dark to where you couldn't even see your way out. A place 
so dark to where you couldn't see an escape route. You couldn't find any direction to head towards. Even having a compass in your hand wouldn't help you in this moment. Even if you had assistance from Google Maps, it wouldn't help you get to the place that you need to go. Because can I tell you, darkness has a presence. Darkness, you can feel the weight and the heaviness of darkness. Has anybody's mind ever wandered to a dark place? A place that says, is life worth living? A place that says, I'm tired. A place that says, I quit, I give up, I throw in the towel. This is too much for me to handle right now. But we are not ignorant of Satan's devices because we know that he is a liar and the father of all lies. And our God is greater. His presence is stronger. He is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Hallelujah. And so the text said that they were abandoned at sea. Picture the scenery, y'all. All hope is lost. Can anybody relate to this 276 people on this ship? Has anybody ever been in a place where you felt deserted all by yourselves? In a situation that was hopeless. How can I survive this divorce? Hmm. How can I survive this financial crisis? How can I survive this assault? on my character, this assault on my ministry, this assault on my children. How can I survive this fall from you, God? The wind just keeps blowing and blowing and blowing. But praise God, we know somebody who has power over the storm. Hallelujah. Who has the power to rebuke the wind and the sea. What manner of man is this that even the winds obey him? Hallelujah. Glory to God. We got to learn how to speak to our storms. We got to learn how to speak to our winds and say, peace be still. Hallelujah. That's a good place right there to give the Lord a praise. No matter what you're dealing with, no, God has the power to change your situation. Thank you, Lord. Verse 21 through 24, it speaks of how confident Paul was in spite of the strong winds. Paul knew who the Lord was, and he was a messenger of God. He understood the assignment. He told everybody on the boat, be encouraged. (laughs) We will live and not die. My assignment is the same today. I've come to encourage somebody to let you know that it's going to be all right. Trouble don't last always. God will make a way out of no way. God will bring you out. God will open up doors that no man can close. God will cover you and protect you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Paul was confident in the fact of an angel visiting him last night. The angel told him that you must get to Rome. You must stand trial before Caesar, Paul, because guess what? The gospel has to be preached. Thank God for the angels that he's dispatched over all of our lives today. Angels that protect us from dangers seen and unseen. Angels that minister to our needs. Angels that intervene on our behalf. And even angels, strangers that we entertain unaware. Somebody ought to give God a praise for the angels that kept you today. Even from the car accident, that even even probably being on the way to church, we never know how an angel covered us. Thank you, Lord. And so the text continues in verse 25. 
And it says something very profound. Paul said this. He said, for I believe God. Wait a minute. Hold on. Remember the situation, y'all, that we're, we, we just read about. You in the sea, darkness, and it's been storming. Y'all been getting hit with wind after wind after blow after blow. But God, but Paul is saying, for I believe God. He said it will be just as he said. Is there any believers here today with the same mindset as Paul? Hallelujah. That says, I believe God. I take him at his word. It shall come to pass. It will happen. His word will not return unto me void. Hallelujah. Even though the situation I'm facing, yes, it's dangerous. The situation I'm facing, yes, it's serious. The situation I'm facing is exhausting, but I believe God. I believe he can make me whole again. I believe he can fix my troubled mind. I believe that he can even heal me from cancer. I believe that he hears my prayers and knows my prayers. Hallelujah. Can I tell us all, we cannot be believers if we simply do not believe. Hallelujah. I believe that he is the same. I believe if he did it before, he'll do it again. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Put your hands together. Give him another praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 26, Paul gives them a reality check, though. He keeps it all the way 100, it's a young folks say. Keeps it real with him. <laughs> he says the contingency, but. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. <laughs> the promise is both good and bad. The boat will be wrecked, but our lives will be saved. Can I tell us life is filled with good and bad news? Life is filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, mountains and valleys. Elliot, hard times will come. You will get hit with blow after blow, and it will knock the wind out of you. Losing your job will knock the wind out of you. Failing a test or an exam will knock the wind out of you. Failing to be obedient by pleasing God will knock the wind out of you. Walking after this flesh, because we know as the Bible says, there's no good thing that dwells in this flesh, and not walking after the Spirit, will knock the wind out of you. Because the devil, y'all, he doesn't fight fear. He doesn't. He knows exactly where to hit us with a low blow and a cheap shot. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, your children will knock the wind out of you. No offense, son. Uh, <laughs> your parents will knock the wind out of you. I said I wasn't going to say this because she's going to be here at the 11 o'clock service. Your spouse will knock the wind out of you. <laughs> I'm talking about me, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Family members, siblings, cousins, Friends will knock the wind out of you because Satan uses those closest to us to hit us the hardest. Who else in your vicinity? <laughs> Matter of fact, he will use you to destroy you because he's that cunning. Hmm. He would rather us to self-medicate ourselves with addictions until we become numb to the presence of Almighty God. But can I tell you, getting the wind knocked out of you will put you in the best position on your knees. <laughs> Crying out to God for help. Calling on the name of the Lord for forgiveness. But can I tell you, 
It is also for your good. Like the psalmist said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn of your statutes. Another scripture says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. See, natural wind offers several benefits like pollination, seed dispersal, climate regulation, air quality, cooling effects to regulate these hot climates of 90s that we've been in a drought season in Columbus. Lord, let it rain. <laughs> but wind represents different things in the scripture. In this particular text Paul is dealing with, a wind represents trials and tribulations. Wind can also represent power. In Exodus, the 14th chapter, verse 21, it talks about how the Lord sends a, a strong wind from the east that caused the Red Sea to be divided. And God displayed his power towards Pharaoh and the Egyptian army and how God allowed his people to cross on dry land. Wind can also represent judgment in Scripture. Y'all remember the story of Jonah? Y'all remember how he was trying to run away from God? Can't run from a God who's omnipresent. <laughs> he's everywhere and didn't go nowhere because he's God. Jonah 1 and 4 talks about how God sent a violent wind and storm to stop Jonah because of his disobedience when he was supposed to prophesy against the evil city of Nineveh. Judgment. But when also represents the breath of life and the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, it's called Ruach. I like that sound. Ruach. It's called Ruach. In the Greek, it's called Pneuma, which are interchangeable words for breath and spirit. You pick it up in Genesis 2 and 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the, the ruah, the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. If you take that over to the New Testament over in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, the pneuma. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and it appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the pneuma, and began to speak in other tongues as the pneuma, the Spirit, gave them the utterance. That's why it's imperative for us to receive and have God's Spirit. As Jesus told Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, do not, do not marvel at these things, but ye must be born again. Yeah. Verse 8 says the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or how it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. That reminds me of a saying that we often used to say in church that says, I can't explain the Holy Ghost. It's something about it that I can't explain, but guess what? I got it. Hallelujah. I got it. I can't explain speaking in a heavy language in an unknown tongue that I didn't study or go to school for. Can't explain it. Can't explain how God takes red blood, makes us white as snow through water baptism and forgives us for all of our sins. Unexplainable. See, we can't see the wind. It's not visible, but we can feel the effects of the wind. Hallelujah. And the same is true with the Spirit of God. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit is evident in our lives. Hallelujah. For we know a tree by the fruit it bears. Hallelujah. We can't see wind, but wind has a sound. Hallelujah. There's a sound called praise that comes from every Holy Ghost filled believer. Is there anybody in here today who brought the sound of wind with you? Did you bring your praise with you? Hallelujah.
hallelujah, then you ought to open up your mouth and give God some praise in this place. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise him for the breath he breathed into your lungs. Praise him for the blessings he's bestowed upon your life. Praise him for where he brought you from. Praise him, hallelujah, for making you new. Praise him for even getting the wind knocked out of you. But it was only temporary. It wasn't permanent. That's why we owe God a praise. Let everything that has breath, let everybody that has breath, that has pneuma, that has ruach, that has his spirit, Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. We owe God a praise. We wasn't fit to be a part of his kingdom. But it was his mercy, his saving grace that allowed us to be in this place today. I owe him a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I owe him a praise. Glory. I got the wind knocked out of me, y'all. I, I testify on my own self. I got the wind knocked out of me. But guess what? I'm still breathing. Hallelujah. I got the wind knocked out of me, but I'm still standing. I got the wind knocked out of me, but I'm still fighting. I got the wind knocked out of me, but I'm still praying. I'm still coming to church. I still got praise on my lips. I, I still got a clap in my hands. I still got worship in my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy, church. He's worthy. We can't never be so tired and too comfortable to praise God. No matter what we're dealing with. Praise him anyhow. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Paul and the crew on his ship they were stranded at sea for a long time, y'all, getting the wind knocked out of them. Two long weeks to be exact. <laughs> stranded at sea in darkness. The crew was worried about their lives so much until Paul had to remind them, look, y'all haven't even taken the time to eat for these two weeks. And can I tell you, worrying will do that to you. We know worrying is not healthy. Worrying will rob you of your appetite. Worrying will steal your joy. Worrying will take away your hope. Paul had to remind them, we are going to get through this, but we will be shipwrecked. And just as the angel told him, guess what? It came to pass. As the ship wrecked, being broken by the violence of the waves, the crew and those who could swim was instructed to first jump off the ship. And then for those who couldn't swim, the Bible says something interesting. And I want us to look at this verse on the screen. Acts 27, 44, the last verse in this chapter. The verse says, and I love how the King James Version reads. It says, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces. Of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Those who couldn't swim survived on broken pieces. Remember the, the ship wreck. We're not talking about a car accident. We're talking about a big ship that carries 276 passengers. 
But look at what the Bible says, and some on broken pieces. Just because your world is shattered, hallelujah. Just because your life is messed up. Just because your heart is broken in pieces does not mean your life is over with. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can I tell you, God can use the broken pieces to save your life. God can mend that which is broken, begin to put everything back together piece by piece by piece because he is the ultimate puzzle solver. Hmm. Isaiah 64 and 8 tells us, and yet, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all formed with your hand. Hmm. Like the crew on the ship who came in on broken pieces. We ought to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm coming in on broken pieces today. Hmm. Whatever I can grab, whatever I can hold on to, I'm coming, God, and I'm coming to you. Hallelujah. I'm coming to you in a broken condition. I'm coming to you in my pain. I'm coming to you hurting from getting the wind knocked out of me. Getting the wind knocked out of me, it, it left me weary. It left me tired and stumbling. It left me battered and bruised, y'all. And if I can be honest, it left me frustrated with questions asking, like, why? Hmm. Why, God, did I have to endure such a storm? Why did I feel all alone? Why did they walk out on me and left me with nothing but misery and sorrow? Why did I almost lose my life? Why did those bullets fly over my head? Why did that accident almost take me out? Why did I get sick unto death? Why, God? Forgive me, Lord, for asking. Forgive me, Lord, for venting. Forgive me, Lord, for not seeing and trusting your plan because I know you're perfect in all your ways. You never made a mistake. So help me, oh, Lord. Help my unbelief. I'm still here, Lord, because of your mercy, before, because of your grace. You brought me to this place today, God. You brought me to your house today, God, and I'm looking for something new. I got the wind knocked out of me, and Lord, I need a, a fresh wind. I need your spirit to move in my life. I need your spirit to teach me your ways. I need your spirit to lead and guide me into all truth. I need your spirit Hallelujah. To intercede on my behalf. I need a fresh wind. Send a fresh wind, God. A wind that will refresh us. A wind that will renew us. A wind that will revive us. A wind that will rejuvenate us. A wind that will rekindle the fire that's in us. <sighs> a fresh wind. We need it, Lord. Breathe a fresh wind on our marriages. <sighs> Breathe a fresh wind on our finances. Breathe a fresh wind over our businesses. Breathe <sighs> a fresh wind over our children. Hallelujah. Breathe on this church, Lord. Let this church be known as a house of prayer. Let this church be known as a house of deliverance. Let this house be known as a house of praise and worship that magnifies your presence and gives you all the glory. It's not about us, but it's about you, Lord. Come on, worship team. I'm finishing. It's not about me. It's not about you. 
But it's about having a collective mind. As Acts talked about, they were in one place on one accord. When we are in one accord, God can do some things that's beyond our comprehension. Something called miracles. When he shows up. When we decrease, he increases. He reigns. He rules with majesty, dominion, and power because he's almighty God. He's to be reverenced. He's to be respected. He's to be magnified and adored. Oh, we adore you, Lord Jesus. We magnify you. We bless your holy name. Hallelujah. We need a fresh wind today. Hallelujah. If you need a fresh wind, you ought to stand to your feet. The altar is open today. Come as you are. If you're broken in pieces, if you have been getting the wind knocked out of you, that's a per perfect position that God can use. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Send a fresh wind, Lord. Let the wind of his spirit give you direction and guidance. Let his wind push you closer and closer to your purpose. God has great things in store for you that you even know not of at this moment. He has some things prepared for you that we have not even touched, have not seen, have not even imagined, but he's already prepared. He's here today saying, yes, I know you've been tried. Yes, I know you've been tested. Yes, I know the enemy has been working overtime to get you to bow down to him. But I know you love me. I know that you're here today for a reason. I know that you have not given up. All hope isn't lost. Because I've kept you in my arms. Safe in my arms. Come on and come to the altar today. Receive your fresh wind. Receive what God has for you. We thank God for sending Jesus, <laughs> the Christ, the anointed one, who got the wind knocked out of him for all of us today. Even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed so hard until sweat began to mix with blood. A medical term called hematidrosis because of the stress he was feeling. As he went to trial, can I tell you, they beat him with 39 lashes. Yes, they did. They mocked him, ridiculed him. They placed a crown of thorn on his head. They pulled his beard from his face. Can I tell you, he was in critical condition even before he reached the cross. Critical condition. Look it up. For medical terms and everything that he suffered and adored. But by the time he got to the cross, he's gasping for breath. Because his own weight of his body is weighing him down. The wind is leaving him. The wind is getting knocked out of him. But praise God, we know that's not how the story ends. Hallelujah, because three days later, he got his wind back. Three days later, he got his wind back. And because he got his wind he didn't leave us windless, but he left us with a comforter. He left us with his spirit that we might have life and life more abundantly. Hey.
Hallelujah. Get your wind back today. Get your wind back today. That's it. Lift up your hands. Begin to just worship him in your own way. Begin to bless him. Strengthen me, Lord. Breathe on me, Lord. Breathe on me. A, a fresh wind. We need you, Lord. We need you in our lives. Breathe on our homes. Breathe on our ministries. Breathe, God. We can't live without you. We can't move without you. Hallelujah. We need you, Lord. Your pneuma, your presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. I, I dare you. I encourage you. Begin to speak in another language. Let the Spirit begin to intercede on your behalf. Use the gift that God has placed within you. And if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, Speaking in the evidence of tongues that the Spirit of God gives the apparent ability. Can I tell you, you can receive the Spirit of God today. You can lift your hands up. You can begin to worship Him. You can ask Him, God, fill me with your Spirit. Begin to call on His name. Begin to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Begin to shout hallelujah, 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 which is the highest praise. Call on him today. He can fill you with life, with the breath of life, with Numa, with a fresh wind. 